In the last lecture, we learned about the exciting and challenging opportunity of investing in IPOs. If IPOs are new and hip, then the subject of this lecture, dividends, is decidedly old school. You may even think of dividends as outdated and dowdy, something only grandma could get excited about. Well, in this lecture, I'm going to change your mind about dividends. You should care about dividends, and in fact, you should care a lot. You may care about them for their own sake, but we'll also learn that there are plenty of other reasons to pay attention to dividends as well. I mentioned dividends in my lecture on stock market basics, but let me refresh our memory. A dividend is a part of the profits of a company that are paid out to the shareholders. The company doesn't have to pay out any dividends, and in fact, many companies don't. Companies that do pay dividends try to keep on paying them year after year, and they try to make the dividends grow at a low but steady rate. If a company doesn't pay dividends, it's because the managers are reinvesting the company's profits on behalf of the shareholders. Now, I can understand why dividends fell out of favor with many stock investors over the years. Starting in the 1950s, firms became less generous about paying out dividends, and this behavior persisted for decades. Also, since dividends used to be taxed as ordinary income, the tax rate on dividends was a lot higher than the tax rate on capital gains. So, given a choice, investors wanted to receive their returns in capital gains instead of dividends, and therefore they stopped pressing companies to pay out as many dividends. In 2003, though, the tax laws were changed, and now dividends are placed on an almost equal footing with capital gains. This helped renew investor interest in dividends. In addition, the low interest rates that bond yielded for several years after the financial crisis of 2008 also reawakened many investors to the value of dividends. The financial crisis also reminded stock investors that capital gains can go way down as well as way up, which in turn reminded investors of the value of having a reliable dividend to fall back on. So one of the reasons you should care about dividends is that they can give you a solid return in their own right. The statistic to pay attention to with a dividend-paying stock is the dividend yield, which is the annual dividend on the stock divided by its price. For example, International Paper was paying an annual dividend of $1.05 per share the last time I checked, and the market price of its shares was $27.22. If we divide the annual dividend of $1.05 by the stock price of $27.22, we get a dividend yield of just over 3.85%. That's not too bad. Now, if I were to buy the shares of international paper in order to earn that dividend yield of 3.85%, then I'd stop caring about the current price of the shares when I calculated the dividend yield. Once I buy a stock, I've essentially locked in the value of the denominator of the dividend yield that I'm going to earn on those shares. So long as international paper continues to pay that $1.05 dividend per share, I'm going to continue to earn the same dividend yield of 3.85%. Of course, if the company increases the dividend, then my dividend yield will rise too. So let's think about shopping for high dividend yield shares. This is something you can always be on the lookout for though one of the best times to do this is during a stock market downturn. When share prices fall, this boosts the value of the dividend yield for many shares, giving you more firms to choose from. What value for a dividend yield should you look for? Many people use the yield on the long-term government bond, say the 10-year note, as the hurdle rate. The idea is that collecting the dividend on a stock is similar to collecting the coupon on a long-term bond so you should buy whichever instrument offers a higher yield. To use the 10-year note to choose stocks, simply find the stocks that pay a dividend yield higher than the interest rate on the 10-year note, and choose from those stocks. You should set your own hurdle rate wherever you feel comfortable as an investor, but this idea of considering the income you could earn on an alternative investment like a bond is a good one. Now, one danger of selecting companies with high dividend yields is that you may select companies whose share prices are falling for good reason. These companies have a high dividend yield now because they're not doing well, but haven't gotten around to cutting the dividend yet. As we'll see later in the lecture, firms try to avoid cutting their dividend as long as they can, so this is a distinct possibility.
Even if the company doesn't cut its dividend if it runs into hard times, the share price may fall so much that the loss would offset the dividend yield if you had to sell the shares. So it's a good idea to do your homework on a firm that you're about to buy because of its high dividend yield. For example, after the financial crisis of 2008, personal finance advisors warned investors to be wary of banks and other financial firms, even though some were paying dividend rates above 5%. Once you do your homework and find a high dividend yield company you'd like to own, you shouldn't hesitate to buy the shares. Typically, high dividend yield firms attract dividend shoppers very quickly and experience rapid price increases that drive the dividend yield down to more ho-hum levels. Most free financial websites and online brokers have the ability to do at least some sorting of shares by dividend yield, so it's relatively easy to find high dividend yielding stocks. If you're really interested in collecting dividends, then an alternative you should consider is preferred shares. Preferred shares are stocks that have a higher priority claim on the company's profits than the common shares do. A company can't pay a dividend on its common shares unless its dividend payments on its preferred shares are up to date. Also, preferred shares promise an explicit dividend. It's written into the stock contract. So preferred shares don't run the risk of a dividend cut, though of course they still run the risk of ba company bankruptcy. There are lots of different variations on preferred shares, especially in terms of their maturity. Although there are many perpetual preferred shares out there, which the company intends to pay dividends on forever, other types of preferred shares have provisions allowing them to be repurchased by the firm on specific dates. Some preferred shares look even more like bonds, in the sense that they have more or less fixed maturities. The weakness of preferred shares is that the dividends are usually fixed in money terms, but the price of the shares can rise and effectively lower the dividend yield on them. Therefore, it's still important to do your homework fairly quickly and not put off making a decision about whether to buy high-yielding preferred shares once you've identified an interesting candidate. If you're a long-term buy-and-hold investor, then there's another reason to cheer for dividends. It's called the Dividend Reinvestment Program, or DRIP for short. Many companies offer DRIPs for their shares as a way to develop a solid base of long-term shareholders. A DRIP is a stockholding plan in which any dividends earned on the shares are automatically reinvested in the shares. So suppose you hold 100 shares of international paper in a DRIP, and it pays that $105 in annual dividends that it promised. This $105 in dividends will buy approximately four more shares of international paper during the year. That's assuming that the price I quoted earlier of $27.22 is an average price for the year. At the end of the year, you'll have almost four more shares, which means more dividends, which means more shares, and so on. Drips can be great wealth builders, and the best part is that once you make the initial purchase of shares, they're on automatic pilot until you want to cash out your investment. So dividends can be attractive for their own sake. They can boost the overall return on a stock investment. They can be the main source of return on your stock investment, and they can build wealth over time. But there's another reason entirely to be interested in dividends, and it has to do with information. A company's dividend policy, that is, the way a company chooses to pay out dividends, and how it changes these payouts over time, reveal a wealth of information about the company. This information can be used by investors to improve their stock picking. It can help you identify firms that are worth looking into, as well as some that are worth avoiding. First, let's look into dividend cuts and dividend increases. The main thing to keep in mind regarding dividend policy is that companies and most investors regard dividends as a long-term commitment. There seems to be an unwritten agreement, what economists call an implicit contract, that firms will only pay dividends that they think they can sustain for the indefinite future. The understanding is that companies will do everything they can to preserve their dividends and to make them grow over time in a sustainable way. This agreement means that companies put off cutting their dividends even after their earnings fall significantly. And companies that do cut their dividends generally do so only after they've exhausted all the cost-cutting possibilities and maybe even only if, after they've run out of credit. 
The implication of all this is that a dividend cut is usually a strong signal that a firm is in big financial trouble. A company that has to cut its dividend will usually see its stock price fall by more than, say, the dividend discount model would predict because of the very powerful negative signal that a dividend cut conveys to the market. Of course, investors follow some companies more closely than others, and they anticipate when companies will cut their dividends. For example, before the financial crisis of 2008, General Motors was forced to cut its dividend, and the markets hardly reacted to the announcement. But that was because by the time that GM got around to actually cutting the dividend, the market had already beaten the shares down in anticipation of this. Again, this shows the value of doing your homework on a high dividend yielding stock. On the other hand, a large dividend increase is also a strong signal from the company about its future financial performance. Remember, all companies try to increase their dividends year to year, but only at a low rate, like a couple of percent a year. But a big dividend increase of, say, 5% or more is a signal of long-term strength. The company managers are saying to the markets, we're so confident about our future profits that we're committing to a big dividend increase that we think we can sustain permanently. So these big dividend increases are actually a way that the managers of the company signal that the projects that the company will be undertaking in the future are going to generate great returns. The information contained in dividend increases is so reliable that there are investors and entire mutual funds devoted to finding firms that repeatedly increase their dividends by large proportions, and they invest in those firms. Instead of searching for serial dividend increasers yourself, you could buy into one of these funds and let the fund managers do the searching for you. One thing that I haven't mentioned about dividends is that they don't necessarily have to be money payments. Anything of value that the company gives to its shareholders is a dividend. Sometimes these in-kind dividends are called shareholder benefits programs. For example, until it was taken private, Wrigley used to send its shareholders 20 packs of gum once a year. Most of these in-kind dividends have fallen victim to cost-cutting, but a few companies still do it. One of the most common types of non-cash dividend is the stock dividend. These are also known to most investors as stock splits. When a company issues a stock dividend, it pays out part of a share instead of cash for each share an investor holds. The most common stock dividends are one share per outstanding share and one half of a share per outstanding share. When a company pays out one share dividend per outstanding share, an investor will receive one additional share for each share that she already owns. After this stock dividend, the investor has twice as many shares as she did before. So this is commonly called a two-for-one split. Similarly, when a company pays a stock dividend of one-half of a share per outstanding share, an investor who had two shares before the dividend will have three shares after it. So this stock dividend is also called a three-for-two split but a company can pay out whatever amount it chooses as a stock dividend. What happens when a company pays out a stock dividend? Well, let's take a two-for-one split as an example. Suppose a company has one million shares outstanding, with a current market price of $100 per share, so that the total market value of the company is $100 million. If the company issues a two-for-one split, suddenly there are two million shares outstanding. But the market value of the company hasn't really changed since the only thing that's happened is that the number of shares doubled. So what should happen is that the price of each share falls by half to 50 bucks per share. Well, so what? Well, the answer, again, has to do with signaling. A lot of companies like to maintain their share price in what they consider an affordable range for individual investors. These companies know that in order to make a stock investment, you need to buy at least 100 shares at a time and so they'll try to keep their share price in a range that enables individuals to afford to buy 100 share lots in their firms. This usually means keeping the share price under $100, and in many cases under $50 per share. When a company issues a stock dividend, one of the things it effectively is saying to the markets is, we think that the value of our shares will keep growing in the future, so we'll cut the price down now to keep it affordable even as it grows. Just like a significant increase in a cash dividend, 
a stock dividend is a signal from the managers of the firm to the general public that they expect high growth of earnings in the future. And in most cases, these signals are followed by good news about successful projects and increasing profits. So the prices of stocks that start, start to split, they start to rise as soon as the split occurs. In fact, many young firms that are growing very quickly will find themselves splitting their shares multiple times within a few years. So stock splits are highly credible signals that the company managers expect strong growth and many investors take stock splits as strong buy signals. Of course, there is such a thing as a reverse split. A company that has seen its share price fall may be in danger of getting kicked off a stock exchange. It turns out that many stock exchanges have rules about the minimum price at which listed companies can trade, and usually this price ranges from $1 to a few dollars per share. So a company that has experienced a big drop in its share price might resort to a reverse split, in which it issues one new share to replace several existing shares. This will distribute the market value of the company over a smaller number of shares and raise the price of the shares in the opposite effect of a stock split. Now, the reason why companies would want to do a reverse split is that getting kicked off at exchange would lead to continued declines in value. When a company is forced to leave an exchange, it basically disappears from most investors' radar. So this loss in investor interest can further damage the value of a company. In the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008, several firms went, underwent reverse splits so that they could remain listed on the New York Stock Exchange. For example, Citigroup underwent a 1 for 10 reverse split in May of 2011. Every 10 shares held by investors before the split were replaced by one share. These examples show that dividend changes and certain types of dividends like stock dividends can send strong messages to the markets about a company's future performance. But there's another use for dividends that also sends a strong signal to investors about a company's dedication to creating value. Dividends are used in some companies as a way to impose discipline on the manager's spending. The idea behind the strategy is pretty simple. I've mentioned in previous lectures that most companies prefer to pay for their new projects out of their current earnings. So in general, having a lot of earnings is good for a company because it means that it can afford to start new investments, like developing a new product. But, when companies, also, but companies also have to be careful when they have high earnings because really good projects don't exactly grow on trees. It's easy to think of things to invest in, but it's actually very difficult to find the few projects that will create real value for a company. When a company has plenty of cash flowing in, managers find that it's easier just to fund a bunch of new projects than it is to take the time to sort through them carefully. Who cares if a few of them turn out to be duds? And on top of that, there's also the danger that managers will waste earnings on pet projects. These are projects that boost the manager's status and image, but don't really boost profits. The higher the company's earnings are, the more managers will be tempted to channel some of these earnings into their pet projects. And as I like to tell my students, idle cash is the devil's workshop. So for some companies, the answer to both of these problems is to pay out high dividends, or rather to pay out a high proportion of their earnings in dividends. This reduces the supply of earnings that could be reinvested in the firm, and that's the source of discipline. With fewer earnings to go around, managers have to put in the effort to choose only the very best projects to receive those scarce funds. In fact, this can set up a beneficial competition for resources inside the firm that leads to better choices for new projects. In managers' pet projects, are generally going to lose that competition. Several academic studies show that the higher the fraction of earnings a company pays out as dividends, the higher the growth rate of earnings tends to be over the next 10 years. This is a pretty robust finding, too. It's worked since the Second World War. And let me just drop a name or two of companies that pay out a very high fraction of their earnings, close to half. One is 3M, and another is Abbott Labs. Now, of course, I'm not saying that all companies that pay out a large fraction of their earnings as dividends are going to be innovative and successful, but experience suggests that these firms are worth looking into. That gives a pretty good overview of why you should care about dividends, even if you're not in it for the dividends. 
What I want to do next is talk about a substitute for paying dividends that has become incredibly popular since the early 1990s. This substitute is share repurchases, also known as stock buybacks. As the name suggests, a share repurchase, or stock buyback, is simply a transaction in which a company goes into the stock market and repurchases or buys back some of its outstanding shares. This is a substitute for a dividend because the company has to pay cash for these repurchased shares. So stock buybacks return cash to the company's shareholders, which is exactly what dividends also accomplish. Stock buybacks have gone from being almost unknown to being one of the things that companies spend the most money on each year. In 1995, for example, there were about $100 billion of share repurchases for the entire year. By 2005, there were more than $100 billion of share repurchases each quarter that year. And in 2007, the amount that companies spent on share repurchases was almost as large as the amount of money they spent on new physical capital, like factories and equipment. This was significant because buying new capital is typically the main investment that companies make. Although share repurchases fell after the financial crisis of 2008, they bounced back fairly quickly and were back above $75 billion per quarter by 2010. The basic similarity between dividends and stock buybacks might make you think that all the great things we've been learning about dividends also apply to buybacks. But in fact, they don't. I'm going to get into the details of why buybacks have become so popular and whether you should pay as much attention to them as you should to dividends. One of the main reasons why buybacks have become a popular alternative to dividends is that for companies, buybacks are more flexible than dividends. If a company has a short-term windfall, a really good quarter where earnings are unusually high, then it can use the windfall to repurchase shares. Remember that dividends are regarded as a long-term commitment. If a company increases its dividend, it's expected to maintain that higher dividend forever. But if the windfall is temporary, as in this example, then the company won't want to increase the dividend. Buybacks give companies a way to pay out that windfall to shareholders without creating any expectations. Another reason why repurchases have become more popular is the different tax consequences of buybacks versus dividends. Before the tax code was changed to equalize the tax treatment of capital gains and dividends, investors preferred buybacks because they led to capital gains, which carried a lower tax rate. But even today, investors still prefer buybacks because the investor gets to choose whether to sell their shares back to the company. In other words, when a company pays a dividend, the company chooses when the investor pays taxes. But in the case of a buyback, the investor chooses when to sell the shares and then to incur the tax liability for the capital gains. A third reason behind the surge in the popularity of buybacks is the rise of stock option compensation at many companies. Starting in the 1990s, more and more companies began to award incentive options to their managers and other employees. These incentive options gave the employees the right to buy shares in the company in the future, but at today's price. So if the company's stock increased in value, the employees would exercise the options and buy the shares from the company. Well, where did the company get all the shares it needed? The answer is that the companies didn't issue new shares. Issuing new shares is expensive, and it involves a huge regulatory hassle. Instead, they bought back their own shares and held them in case they needed to sell them to the option holders. When shares are repurchased by the company, they don't disappear. Instead, we say that the company holds them as so-called treasury shares. Imagine the company buying its own shares and then stashing them in a safe inside company headquarters. That's basically what happens. The treasury shares don't collect dividends because it's kind of silly for the company to pay dividends to itself. But otherwise, they're real shares that can be put, put back on the market at any time. So part of the story behind the rise of share repurchases is that companies issued billions of stock options, and so they bought back billions of shares to sell to the option holders. Now, the last reason why buybacks have become so popular is the most interesting. It's based, again, on a signaling story. A few minutes ago, we learned about the signals that dividend cuts and stock dividends send to investors. The idea here is that stock buybacks, like dividends, 
can send a strong positive signal about the value of the company. The argument in this case goes like this. The managers of a company know a lot more than investors do about the company's true value because they have access to much more information about how the company is actually performing. So if the managers of the company go out into the market and buy back stock on behalf of the company, they could be indicating to the market that they think the shares of the company are undervalued. In fact, if you read any quotes from company managers who announce buyback programs, they typically describe the rationale for the buyback in terms of buying a dollar bill for 50 cents, and some say exactly that. If the managers of the company signal to the market that the shares are undervalued, then investors may come running to buy the shares. And of course, this helps drive the price of the shares up. In the early days of buybacks, before they were very widespread, some academic studies found that buyback program announcements were associated with 10% increases in share price. Wow, that's a nice improvement in share price for not much effort. Well, with results like this, word got out pretty fast that announcing share buyback programs was a surefire way to boost the share price. So as you can probably guess, companies large and small started to announce all kinds of share repurchase programs. Everyone wanted to signal to the market that their shares were undervalued. Well, if everyone claims that their shares are undervalued, they can't all be right, can they? Also, the timing didn't look so great. Companies kept announcing more and more buyback programs as the economy boomed and the stock markets rose to new highs. So companies were in the odd position of arguing that their shares were undervalued when the prices of their shares were higher than ever. So the short story is that the quality of the signal in stock buybacks seriously deteriorated over time. If you know some engineering, then you could say that the signal-to-noise ratio in share buybacks fell dramatically as the amount of noise in the market increased. The main reason companies were giving to investors for their buybacks, this undervaluation story, simply lost credibility. It also didn't help that companies who announced buyback programs didn't actually follow through on them. Many firms announced multi-year buyback programs and then quit after the first one or two repurchases. There are plenty of reasons why buybacks remain popular today. Investors like the tax flexibility, and companies like the lack of long-term commitment. In addition, companies are still using a lot of stock-based compensation, and so they need to repurchase shares in order to make good on these commitments. But you should think twice before believing a firm's claim that its shares are undervalued when it announces its latest buyback program. At the end of the day, the fundamental difference between share buybacks and dividends is that dividends force a company to put its money where its mouth is. So when you pick stocks, you should look for companies that do just that with their dividends. These are companies that maintain a high dividend yield, companies that consistently increase their dividends over time, and companies that pay out a high proportion of their earnings in dividends. Growing firms that like to engage in stock splits are good investments too, though they can be harder to find. Dividends literally show you the money. Are you a dividend believer now?